Hello and welcome to Pookie Ponders, the podcast where I explore big questions with brilliant people. Today's question is, how can we ensure children are happy, safe and engaged? And I'm in conversation with Paul Hodgkinson. Okay, thank you. My name's Paul Hodgkinson. Um, I'm up in Bolton. Um, I'm the executive principal of the Bolton Impact Trust, which is a multi-academy trust comprising um, four AP academies and also um, an SEMH special school academy. Um, a little bit about myself. I taught PE and maths in a PRU um, up from 1997. So this is my 24th, 25th year now in AP. Uh, my first headship was in 2005 of one of the big PRUs in Bolton. Um, in 2010, I was invited to um, head up the Federation of Four Pupil Referral Units in Bolton. And I did that for six years. Um, in 2014, we were asked to support a school that was in quite challenging circumstances. Um, it had just gone into special measures. There were some significant difficulties up there in terms of um, children's behaviour, in terms of processes. Um, so we went in there in 2014. In 2016, we were asked whether or not we would take it into our organisation. But in order to do that, we had to, or we converted to become the Bolton Impact Trust. So they became part of our organisation um, in 2016. Um, we, I'm an executive board member of the National AP PRU organisation, PRU's app. Um, I've been involved in 50 plus school to school support assignments, usually in AP and in special schools, but we also, we transfer some of our, our processes and our footprint, our blueprint rather, into the mainstream sector. Um, my schools, my academies have been judged eight times outstanding by Ofsted, which we're very proud of. Um, there's been many times where I've not been judged outstanding also, but we, um, we're we very proud of, we think we've found a formula for what constitutes decent provision um, for children who maybe struggle to access mainstream education. So my, my whole career has been spent in AP and special, um, but we, we love sharing our sort of ideas around best practice and next practice. We also love sharing um, and um, sort of receiving new ideas from colleagues as well. Fantastic. And the episode question today where we'll jump off, but it sounds like there's loads of different directions we might go, um, is how can we ensure children are happy, safe and engaged? So would you mind making a start on this massive question, Paul? Yeah, we 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 can start before COVID, I think. I think one of the things that we were really clear about in 2017, a report came out, which... I think it came out from the difference and it was an excellent report around alternative provision. And it really began to, we began to poke us a little bit in terms of, there was a question in there around, do we really understand what success looks like in alternative provision? And I think you can probably transfer this into the mainstream sector as well. And we went away and we really thought about the question that was posed and we really wanted to understand in our world, in our, in our environments, what does success actually look like? And we came up with an idea um, around what outcomes are good outcomes for children in AP and special schools. And we came up with two, two concepts, the idea of phase one outcomes and phase two outcomes. I think that phase one outcomes are important. They relate to a really critical part of our work and they measure those pastoral indicators. Evidence, we collect evidence and we analyze evidence around things like engagement, attendance, resilience, social ability, behavior, mental well-being, quality of life, um, experiencing success and failure, making friends, trying new things, that sort of thing. And that's really, really important. And we think that that's intri intrinsically linked to what we would call traditional outcomes as well. Um, and that's our phase two outcomes, which relate to vocational progress, academic progress, attainments, and, and post-16 destinations, etc. So when we when we 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 read the report and we digested the report, we, we decided that a lot of the stuff that we do would be around phase one and phase two outcomes. And actually it tied in quite well with the new Austin framework where there was now some real emphasis on personal development as well as the behavior and attitude stuff. So, so we built our whole processes and our whole systems now around children experiencing success and failure in both phase one and phase two. And I think when we do our school to school support work, one of the things that we, we see in schools in challenging circumstances that they've not got quite 
got the curricular balance right, particularly in terms of SAMH, because often they're really ambitious with their curriculum around maths and English and science and history and geography and French and Spanish and all those really important things. But actually, there's not enough time dedicated to those really important things around the phase one stuff that I talk about. And I think that the trap that a number of provisioning we've worked with quite recently would admit that they've fallen into is that those things like social communication, those things like contributing to the community, those things like, as I say, sharing um, exp uh, experiencing success and failure and stuff like that, resilience, um, engagement, they, they're not quite, there's not enough time designated to them. And we think we've, we've built some processes now where we're able to say, you know what, our children get a really decent package where we look after the phase one, we look after the phase two. And actually, if phase one is done really well, phase two naturally can follow, provided teaching and learning is good and pedagogy and stuff like that. But it, equally, if pedagogy is done really well and teaching and learning is done really well, we believe that that has a, a, a flip in the narrative, that has a really important knock-on effect on the things that we talk about at phase one. If we get phase one right, and if we get phase two right, we believe that our children will be engaged, will be happy, will be safe. Now, we then, we, we then had to make some decisions around lockdown and around COVID. We, we received the guidance from the government. It was sometimes a little bit hard to understand. Um, we didn't quite understand what it was asking us to do, particularly in alternative provision. Um, so we, we made a decision. We made a decision with my leadership team and, and we, then we spoke to Sarah and the guys at Prue's app. And we said, how can we ensure that when our children aren't with us or when some of our children aren't with us, that they actually remain safe, remain happy, remain engaged. So we created a process, if we want to call it that, of seven key questions. And through developing a checklist and some lines of inquiry, we satisfied ourselves that if we could answer yes to each of these questions, then we could pretty much ensure that our children fell into the safe, happy and engaged um, brackets. The questions that we looked at, we, we put the guidance to one side because the guidance clearly stated that all, at first the guidance stated that all children who were classed as vulnerable, AP and special, should come into school. We had to balance this up with trying to manage a really nasty virus, a global pandemic type thing. So we decided to, to then analyse which of our children would best be suited to come into school and which would best be able to stay at home. Because many of our families, there's lovely infrastructure. They did magnificently during the first lockdown. Uh, the children really thrived, particularly some of the children you maybe wouldn't have expected to do, children with mental health issues, et cetera, et cetera, um, because some of their anxieties came from actually attending school. So we, we then decided to, we created the priority list first and foremost. So we've got priority one, priority two, priority three. Children on priority one are the children who we felt were safer in school. And when we look at priority, we look to things like crime, drug, gangs, their own mental health, the home life, the safety nets at home. Um, we also looked at child protection status and things like that. Um, and also we went with some of our own hunches and looked at some of our own intelligence. All priority one children come into school or come into our settings. And then priority two children, they get a daily visit and a daily contact. And priority three children, they get a twice weekly contact visit, et cetera, and remote learning, live learning kicks in. We'd got the priority one children in, but we needed to be clear that the priority two and priority three children remained safe, happy, and engaged. So these are the seven questions we decided on. Has every child been offered what is appropriate for them from using our own intelligence? So can they learn appropriately at home? Are they safe at home? Is there any mitigating and then any factors that might not make them safe or happy? And if they're happy, if we're happy for them to stay at home, we can, we can teach them at home. If not, they can come in. Our parents and carers in agreement with each decision. So we constructed some questions and some, some processes to, to work with every single parent out of our 250 children to understand that they were happy with what we were doing at that time. And the, the, the packages that were designed would work for, those, for their children. Is every child safeguarded? 
uh, and I can go into that a little bit more in a minute, is the curriculum of a high quality every day, not only content, but also delivery and impact. We brought the three eyes into it. Are we regularly reviewing the priority list? We had some children one week would be priority two, the next week would be priority three. Things happen in the lives of priority one. So are we regularly doing that across the five settings? Are staff contributing equally? This was an important one. And when, when we presented this in the past, people have said to us, um, is this to test that all staff are, are really working hard and they're not skiving or they're not having afternoons off? We didn't create the question for that. We created the question because some of our um, CEV staff in the first lockdown, they felt really left out and they felt like they weren't contributing and they wanted to contribute. So what we actually did with our CEV staff, we managed to, to create or to, to um, ensure that they had work that they could contribute um, just as equally as the staff who were on site or the staff who weren't CEV. So that's the reason why we did that. And then the, the final part for us was, was communication with parents, trustees, governors and commissioners. Um, is it strong enough? And I think there were the seven questions. It received quite a lot of positivity in terms of this is very pragmatic, it's very sensible, it's certainly not sophisticated, it's just a very simple way of, uh, of analysing. And if we can get yes to each of those seven questions, then I think we wouldn't be far off ensuring that our children were safe, happy and engaged. And I guess getting to yes is uh, is a challenge uh, with some of those questions. And they, I'm really interested to pick some of them apart. Um, up towards the top of the list there was about working with parents and carers and then being in agreement with each decision. Um, yeah. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit more about why that um, felt so important. Yeah, we, 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 we are, we're collaborative and we, you know, we, we do work well with the parents. We, we recognise that the parents were, were it was a tough time for them as well. Um, we were making some really big decisions in terms of schooling, in terms of safeguarding, and we, we wanted to get the parents on board. We, we felt it was important that we weren't doing it to them, we were doing it with them. We agreed on that. We we generally work like that anyway. We, we have a lot, we do a lot of work with our parent groups. We have a lot of support networks for our parents. We have therapists ready to, to work with our parents if they're struggling. So we, we, we have this sort of relationship going on with them anyway what we decided to do between myself and my vice principal every thursday we picked a group of parents and we formed them every thursday afternoon through lockdown and we we, we created a set of questions um very simple questions um we asked them this was across all of the, the six uh, we've got five academies we've got six different sections across the six sections we asked a set of questions what does your child's offer currently look like and we, we, we talked to them about that. Um, we asked them whether or not it was decided in partnership with them. We asked them, were they happy with the offer? We asked whether or not staff were in regular contact. We asked whether or not the children were engaged in their learning. And we asked if there's anything that we can do better. And they were the six standard questions that we asked every Thursday to our random group of parents who we put out the registers, et cetera, et cetera. We then created a grid of answers. And if any of the answers we flagged as red, that we think we can be done a little bit more, or it could be done a little bit better, or we need to push it a little bit more, we'd then go back to the academy teams and say that Mrs. Smith has reported that um, they think that we can do this, this, and this. And then we'd usually get an action from it. So I'll give an example up at Lever Park, the special school. I spoke to Mrs. Whittle, Callum's mum. She was very happy with, um, she was working very hard. He was really working with his mentor and his teachers. He'd done very well with his functional skills. He'd matured a lot in the period at home. Um, the, the, the staff had been unbelievable. He's really engaged in his learning. And she said that he's going to college in September to do mechanics, but he's not done any mechanics for a while. So I spoke to the vocational lead up at the school and we put some mechanics on for him on a couple of afternoons. I phoned her again a couple of weeks later and she was thrilled to pieces because now he got that. So, so we listened to her, we acted off her, her sort of um, her prompts and, and we just felt that it was a really collegiate way of doing it with the parents. They know the children really well. Um, we, we had some examples where we phoned up and the children weren't doing particularly well at home. So we moved them to the priority list and we brought them in. Um, there was a lot of stuff around the children who were on the vocational packages, the BTEC packages. We dropped bricks and mortar and all sorts off for them to do it at home, but it wasn't quite the same. So we brought quite a few of those children in. And actually, when we spoke to the parents, um, 
we we made a lot of changes. We we listened to them and they, they were brilliant in that. So they helped us to design the provision at that time, and it was important that we were allowed to do that. That's that's impressive that you were able to be so um, so responsive. And I love the idea of dropping off bricks and mortar at home as well. <laughs> it, was, it was funny because I phoned Callum up, and his mum said, "Actually, you've just dropped some cake mix off and some instructions, and he's actually baking in the kitchen now." So it was lovely to hear that. So, oh. but, but yeah, it was. Um, we, we had to. Try, we wanted to try and recreate it. You can't recreate everything, and so as we've unlocked a little bit. A lot more of our vocational children have come in to do uh, that sort of thing because obviously um, we wanted to make sure that they could still access it. A lot of our children have loved the vocational stuff. So, yeah, that was how we worked with the parents. And, and our parents are great. They, 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 they let us know, you know what I mean? They do let us know if it's, you know, and we quite like that. Absolutely. And then I'm interested to hear a bit more about the safeguarding element as well, because obviously that's, a, that's absolutely crucial and you're presumably working with a, somewhat more vulnerable population than um, your typical mainstream setting so how did yeah. you ensure that throughout lockdown and what does that look like for you normally as well yeah safe, safeguarding is critical for us we, we have obviously designated safeguarding leads in each of the academy settings um my vice principal um she she leads safeguarding for the for the trust we agreed early on the priority list system um we, we ran it through the dfe the dfe liked it i think they took it to the ministerial team they thought it was a really simplistic way of doing things and basically every single one of my children in all of our settings was graded in one of the priority lists as I say, many of the children, um, we know a lot about them. We, we've got intimate relationships with their families and with the agencies who they work with. And we, we, it was very, very easy for us to prioritise the children into those three lists. One of the things that we were really keen on, we, we, we worked with um, Amy Smith down in Surrey, um, down, down at um, Way, Way College, and they, they'd introduced this eyes on system where you could safely, during the first lockdown, when everything was shut down, really, you could safely go knock on, step back. And we had a number of children across the organisation, across our trust, who we were keeping eyes on every day. Um, we then had, we, we then, we utilised our CPOM systems and stuff, um, and we logged every single contact on CPOMs by 2pm every day. Um, any alerts, any concerns would go to the safe, designated safeguarding leads, and that then we would pick up from there, including those regu regular reviews of the priority lists. Um, the questions that we asked to the, the academy teams were, what are your daily safeguarding processes? Is every child contacted every day as priority one children? Is every child contacted every two days as a priority two child? Who's monitoring the contact? Who's monitoring the logs? What we're doing when red flags emerge? Do all staff know the process for raising the safeguarding concerns so from training going on at the same time? Um, what the home visits look like and the eyes on processes? What are the processes in place if you're unable to contact a pupil? Um, how often do you update social workers on specific pupils? And what's the pupil wellbeing offer? We then built up our, our links with the agencies um, whether it's the social work teams, whether it's the, the, the local uh, LAC team or the youth offending team, the police, the local police, uh, and other agencies and specialists as well. So we, um, we, we believe that our process and our checking systems um, were strong enough to ensure that we knew everything that was going on with all the children. Um, if a child, if we couldn't make contact, um, it would immediately become an eyes on visit. If the eyes on visit, if twice we didn't get contact, we'd then go into the specialist teams in Bolton. Um, so we, we created, I suppose I'm not articulating as well as I can do, we, we, anything at all that, that emerges as a red flag child, then, then we passed it up straight away. Um, and touch wood, we've not had anything significant in terms of um, any major safeguarding concerns. If we felt that children because of crime, drugs, gang, or because of a lack of learning, when we started to ease, these were the children that we brought in. They, these were our most vulnerable, um, and we, we brought them straight back in. And, you know, ultimately, Bolton were really supportive of us, and we spoke to um, the, the, the Director of Children's Services, and she said, if there's any children you think are probably safer with you than not, yeah. then bring them in, and that's what we did. Absolutely. And and I think it's it's always it's always challenging, even in the most uh, normal quote unquote of times to um, to ensure the, the safeguarding of every child. But actually, that became yeah significantly more challenging, didn't it? And uh, but it sounds like you had to. 
I think so. And it became easier as, as we got better with things like online learning mm -hmm. and we, we, we used our team stuff and all that. Um, and we got the technology into the homes and stuff. It became, it was very raw at the start. It was very crude at the start. We were literally getting in the minibus, knocking on the door, stepping back. We were dropping food parcels. We were doing things like, um, <clears throat> there was an example, one of my staff who works in Preston, which is like 45 minutes away. Um, it was one of her guys on her, one of the boys on her case load it was his birthday and she drove from Preston to Bolton knocked on the door put his card and his present on the path got back in the car and drove off and it was all a bit like that at first it was as if the internet hadn't even been invented um, <laughs> um, and it was brilliant because we saw loads of absolutely unbelievable practice going on and we saw loads of the staff going over and above more than they do normally when we got the technology sorted and when we got the, the it was easier for us to, to teach with, with the Google Classroom stuff was fantastic and other stuff that we used as well. But I think then um, it helped with safeguarding practices, communication, uh, eyes on stuff and all that. And like I said, we always, always kept them priority one children right at the forefront of our mind, particularly in terms of safeguarding. Absolutely. And you mentioned before we started recording that there's been a bit of a change in the profile of, of behaviour um, in, in your area and there's been sort of raising things like knife crime and stuff is that something you're happy to talk a little bit about yeah we, it was interesting we we we'd, Bolton is a happy little town and we 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 um we'd never seen some of these big city behaviors before um and what we we saw an emergence of was the new levels of, of children carrying knives we've seen a couple of incidents quite high profile incidents where um knives had been used um and this wasn't behaviour that we'd seen before. Um, we, we've done a piece of work here um, at the Impact Trust um, around maybe some of the, the early indicators of, of why that might happen. It looked like some of the children who were involved, we knew some of the children who were involved, had during lockdown spent time still out on the streets. Um, we'd seen the emergence of um, a number of different facets or gangs in the town from different geographical areas. Uh, we'd seen an increase certainly in um, street robbery and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, we, we, we did see that. We've also, since we've come back to, uh, to, to school, um, we've seen an increase in the number of children who've been referred through to us after permanent exclusion and, and weapons have been cited um, yeah. as, as reasons for exclusion as well. So. Bolton acted really uh, decisively and really quickly. They, they, there's now a, a strategy group which is headed up by the local authority. We're involved in that. We um, we have representatives on that um, because we think that we, we know down on the ground what the triggers might be, who's involved. We've done a profiling of all of our children and the ones who seem to be involved in the knives. Um, there's, there's a consistent message coming out that they're in different, they're in certain parts of the town, they're into different, they're into certain styles of music, they dress in a certain way, they might have seen some domestic violence in the past. So we, we've now got a, like a, a quite a clear picture of who the children are who might next get involved. So we're working with professionals to try and jump in and go upstream before they all dive into the deep end with that. So yeah, but it's, it's been a new thing. I, I, like I say, I've worked in special education in Bolton for coming up to 25 years. And Bolton is at a town that's, that, that's seen much of this. And it just seems to have increased in the last three or four months. But I must say that, that the local authority and the police and the agencies have acted really quickly, one, to understand why, and two, to try and mitigate the risks. But yeah, there's been some new behaviours emerged, certainly. Is that something that you've heard from colleagues elsewhere in the country? Has there been, uh, you know, these kind of big city behaviours evolving elsewhere or...? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I have a colleague up in Lancashire who now she's running a special school and they have um they have um an arch, a knife arch, you know, the with the the detectors on. Um and that that's 20 miles away. Um so yeah, I have colleagues, Steve Howell in Birmingham and some of our colleagues down in London who who They've seen these behaviours for a while. They have really good links with the violence reduction units and really good links with the police and other agencies and stuff. But we, we sort of sat back and listened to them in, in absolute awe because we, we just hadn't seen... We're, 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 um, we, we're quite new to it, really. And we had, we, we've had some really tough lads through over the years, but mm. it's never quite got to that. And we saw the signs probably just after Christmas in Bolton. 
um, of these new behaviours arriving. Um, and like I said, we've had to act quite quickly. Of course, as well, speaking to colleagues from um, from the national picture, so people like Steve and stuff who have been really advisory in their advice to us around how we best go about it. But but Bolton's really on to this now, and I'm hoping that we can we can we can put a bit of a stop to it because it is quite worrying. We we're, we're seeing younger children, years year seven with knives in school and stuff. And we've, we've, we've tried to understand as well with the knife thing in Bolton. Um, we've tried to understand certainly, you know, is it, what are the reasons why, why is this happening? And then which groups are most likely and then see if we can, we can get some education in before it happens. And I think that's the piece of work that's going on at the moment. It sounds like you're practicing all those uh, things that we so often talk about, kind of, you know, around sort of curiosity and empathy and really beginning to explore what what what's this behavior kind of telling us and what's the need here rather than going straight in with that sort of punitive response. Presumably that's kind of a very much the way that you, you work generally then or we, we, we do. We, we em empathy is interesting for us. We we've tried to over the last few years, we've changed our recruitment strategy here, certainly where in the past we, we, we put adverts out for jobs and we, we brought in candidates of a certain ilk, but we've changed our recruitment strategy in the last three or four years. And we've really looked now, in the, for the teachers, we've really looked at them with who've got mainstream pedigree and now uh, um, pedigree notes around things like pedagogy, teacher and implementation impact, all that sort of stuff. In terms of our support staff now, we've gone more for experts by experience or lived experience. So we have ex-pupils who teach here now who have been working with me for three or four years. Um, we have one example, uh, one of my um, learning mentors is extremely talented. He, he's very impactful in his work. He was a, a student of ours 10 years ago. He, he'd seen a lot at a very young age. Um, he came to us and he, he, he turned his life around really. He then went out to, he became a bricklayer, he then became a quantity surveyor. And then three or four years ago, he came and said to me and said, I'd love to get, came to see me and said, I'd love to give something back. Um, so he, we, we appointed him. He, he left, he's an incredible member of staff now. Um, he knows more about what's going on than I ever would or ever could. He's an expert and he's, and he's lived it. So we're really encouraging this now. Some of the guys who we work with, we, there's an organization born called Wise Up. These, these are guys who've got lived experience. Um, we utilize them more and more. So our recruitment strategy and, and who we use now um, is really important. So the knife crime thing kicked off and we have a boy who came to us six or seven years ago. He's not a boy anymore, but he came to us six or seven years ago. He got involved in the gangs, he got shot. Um, that sort of thing in Manchester. Um, he came and saw me the other week. He's very articulate. He's very changed. He's a very sort of inspiring chap now. He's going to come and do some work and he's going to come and work with the boys. So, so that expert by experience thing is really important for us. And if you look at my team now, I've got 130 in my team and it's a real mixture. And I have guys who've been inside, guys who've been in the army, guys who are ex-students. I've got... Um, female staff who've been debt collectors, I've got some who've been homeless, um, I've got some from the traveller background, I've got boxing champions. So we've got a real mix of people who've seen a bit, done a bit, lived it. To understand where our children are, I, I think that's really important. So I think our recruitment strategy has been really, really important in getting the right people in position to work with our children. And it's, it's hugely impactful. And presumably they act as really important role models for your children as well, because they can see here's someone who maybe has got some similarities to myself and look. Well, you, you know, you, the live case studies, aren't they? And yeah. you, you look at the, the lad who, who, who works with me now, Troy, and like I say, he'd seen a lot at 15. He got moved out of a really big city because of some problems that he was involved in. Um, and he can tell a story and, and he tells a real story, but he is also, he's a family man. He, he, he's got a great job. He drives a lovely car. He's a very caring chap. Um, he's still extremely sort of, the, the guys here, the children here hold him in real high esteem because he's still cool. He's far cooler than I am. Um, and, and he's very, very, a message from Troy or a message from me, you know, the, 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 there's no there's no comparison, and he is a real live working example. And we, we've just got a girl came and saw me. Sophie was a girl who was here last year. Her college 
placement has, has uh, finished now and she's got some spare time. She's going to come and work in the summer term, work in teaching um, some of the hair and beauty stuff with Kelly, my hair and beauty teacher. Sophie, is a, she's really turned her life around and she's a remarkable example of, of, of a successful child. She was in a really poor place. To have her over the summer term, I think we're really lucky because I think our girls will really look up to her. Um, she's another live case to be. So we're, we're dead into that and we, we like that. So yeah, Sophie will join us after Easter and she'll, she'll be 17, 18 year old and she'll be doing some teaching and the girls will listen to her because she's got that credibility and it, she's not learned it from a textbook. She's lived it and seen it and done it. And, you know, th there's, no experience, there's, no, there's no substitute for that, I don't think. And what a testament to the environment that you've created that... Uh, young people who I'm sure in many cases were not necessarily loving attending school mm -hmm. before they came to you actually mm -hmm. choose to come back and give something back there. Yeah. What's your advice um, to um, other settings? And I'm thinking particularly about mainstream here who, who might be really struggling with children who are finding it difficult to attend right now. So we've seen like, I'm, I'm getting reported a huge uptick in, in school-based anxiety um, and avoidance and children who found it really difficult to return. And I've got a live case study at home um, after the, the last lockdown. I mean, this is stuff you've done forever, right? You've had children who've been uh, struggling to attend and, and, and you've had to integrate after long periods of absence from school. What have you learned that you can, you can share with colleagues there? Yeah, it's, it's really simple. I, th I think the answer is probably shorter than it should be, but we, we created, we, we, we have two provision where children, um, we have our provision called the Park School, which is for children who either come from tier four, um, um, you know, um, secure units type thing. They've got suicidal ideation, um, really high anxiety, um, et cetera, depression, stress type um, illnesses. And we have our personal learning centre where children have been out of school sometimes for six months or more. Um, and we found out quite both of those provision are really high quality provision. One of the key things we've got to do, if we go back to the phase one stuff, we've got to first get them to attend. Then we've got them to engage and we've got to get them working independently. And they're, they're the, the three key things that we do. I think that if we'll take Ryan as an example, Ryan was a boy who was in school. Um, he started with us in September. His last day in mainstream school was at the end of February of the same year. So he'd been out from February to he'd have the Easter holidays, the summer holidays and all that school time that he'd missed. We recognised that if we'd have brought Ryan in straight away, it would have been, it would have defeated the object. He wouldn't have engaged with us. He had a very negative experience of school. He had a very negative perception of school. So what we did with him, we, we created a process a number of years ago that we called graded exposure. And what we basically did is that we we designed packages to build children up very slowly. And sometimes the less is more philosophy worked really well. We allocated Ryan, if we use Ryan as an example, um, one of the, the, the male members of staff down at the personal learning centre, um, he, he knocked on, he took him for a coffee, he understood that he really was interested in golf. Um, so he used to take him to the driving range and gradually he would build up his contact time. And this was over a period of, our design stage for our curriculum is anything between four and six weeks. So in that four to six week period, um, we, we, we do a lot of the sort of the pastoral, the relationship type stuff then we introduce some smaller elements of some maybe academic testing or some some social profiling stuff then we gradually build up to maybe some time in center and then we'd go to maybe mornings or a couple of full days then hopefully by week six we can begin to bring them in right ryan's 100 percent attender in center now and i think we have many examples the graded exposure philosophy or or methodology has served us really really well we we, we did we, we took we took note of, you know, I think it was, um, was it Barry Car Carpenter, who, Oxford Brooks, who did the stuff around the recovery curriculum. Yes. And, you know, you can't underestimate this idea that, you know, social settings, mixing with peer groups, allowing that to happen slowly and gradually was really important to us. Um, sometimes educating children in the art of being educated is, but that has to be done really slowly. We have to reopen their minds to learning and to social environments. So the gradual graded done again with, with the child and with the parents has been really important. So yeah, the graded exposure stuff is stuff we, we don't put too much pressure on. We, we understand about children's windows of tolerance. 
we understand about that work and we understand that you know the success that we've achieved with our children over the years is because we've reduced anxiety for them in the classroom but also outside of the classroom um if if we can you know if you're understanding we've got to try and keep the children within that window of tolerance through positive source interaction by not putting too much pressure on them to eliminating that thing where they might fight or fly and and that's really important to us so every child has a different tolerance level and we just have to understand where they are and then we can build our provision around them so so we we, we do think about it quite a lot yeah and do you ever have children that you feel unable to to kind of meet the needs of or have you been able to always adapt and change to to work with every child I think there's not been many over the years I don't think I think that we've always been able to adapt I think we've got the flexibility we, we, we have a commissioner in Bolton who are really understanding of you know if, if we can't do it there must be something you know significantly not quite right here so they allow us the flexibility to some children will be as we've seen during the lockdown very comfortable working from home some children will be very comfortable because they're so anxious they might do a two o'clock to five o'clock in center curriculum um, someone might do we, we, we've had saturday morning clubs we have children over the holidays and stuff like that it's not one size fits all certainly and i think we've been allowed that flexibility one from the commission and the schools who we serve as well so it's rare that we're not able to meet the needs. We might have to adapt sometimes. I think the majority of the children, the majority of the time with us are able to do the, the nine o'clock till three o'clock um, and our design systems ensure that we personalize it for them. Um, there are a handful of children who would, would make um, adaptations to the curriculum just because they probably either can't handle the full day or sometimes the dynamics or, you know, all sorts of different things like that. So, yeah, we, 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 the flexibility is critical for us. And do you think that if you introduce that flexibility and you adapt the environment or the curriculum to meet the needs of, of each child in that way, that all of our children are capable of, of succeeding? Yeah, I think so. I think we, we, we have a design system. Um, we, 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 we have something that we call our, uh, our curriculum uh, flow chart. It's how you design. And like I say, our, our design system is between four and six weeks um, long. We, we gather at that first stage, we gather loads of intelligence. We, we work with um, we work with other agencies. We work with referring schools. We work with um, parents. We work with the child themselves. And what we try and do during that first stage is we try and understand what their SMH needs, what their academic abilities, what are the social needs, what are their previous attendance patterns, um, what are the typical behaviours, what are the triggers, how can we go upstream and help them earlier. And we paint a really, really personalised profile. We then have a massive menu of services and off that menu of services, we allocate to each child. So each child has got then, they take options from our curricular menu. We then begin to understand how they best learn, you know, um, are they best learning vocational, small group, individually. So, so learning styles are taken into consideration. We, we allocate them the key worker. It's really important that we do that and what support they need. We look at which support it, they require from external agencies. And, and then we begin the process of trying to implement the plan in terms of executing the plan in terms of teaching and learning support. I think that because of those design systems, because of them early identification systems, we can find a way with most children. I think if we, as I said earlier, and this is where I think, this is where sometimes we, 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 we cringe a little bit, I think in some of the provision that's not doing quite as well with their children. I think if a child starts and you throw them straight into seven or eight GCSE classes, I think it's a classic trap. Um, I'm not saying that our way is the right way. It works for us. And what it generally does, it ensures that children, the work is pitched well, um, the, the, the anxieties are reduced correctly. Um, and we think that we've got appropriate provision for appropriate children at the appropriate time. Um, the challenge is, is at the end of the, the review period, whether or not, if we've got it right, and if we're seeing signs that the children um, are achieving successes against their personal success targets, do we then look at a return to mainstream or do we push it a little bit further to challenge them? Because it's very hard to recreate a mainstream position or a mainstream school 
in, in a class where they only talk with eight other children or in a sense that's only got 30 children. So that, that's the challenge for us. But at the review stage, we then ask ourselves, are they ready to return or they need to apply a little bit more challenge? So review is crucial for us as well. Going back to your original question, I think that if you if you design well and, and you get enough at that design stage, that intent stage, if you get enough, if you get enough intelligence from everybody, I think then you can design in order to try and make the children more successful than they have been previously. And that's how we do it. We call it our three eyes floor chart. Intelligence led design, intelligence led delivery and review, and then decide what happens next. If they're experiencing consistent successes, we'll put them back out into the mainstream sector. Um, if they're not, then we'll go back to the start of the cycle and, and we'll design again to see if we can find the right way. We go back many times. We don't get it right first time. You know, we, 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 we're not about that at all. I think that design, deliver, review. Is, is, it's a bit like the old um, assess plan, do review. But we, we, we just used it now with the, the Ofsted language, it's intent, implantation and impact. And, and if impact's not quite right, we'll go back and we'll, we'll sort the intent bit out again. It's like everything in education, isn't it? You hang around long enough and... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we, 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 there's, there's language coming back in now that we heard 20 years ago, isn't there? Yeah, um, yeah. But yeah, but, but but absolutely critical, you know, get them at the right part of the menu and feed them the right diet. And, and I think that you can. The critical bit is if you get the diet wrong. And I, and we, we see that. And we've been in a school recently, we're doing some school to school support. And we had the most ambitious curriculum I've ever seen in AP. And actually, the children, they had nine lessons a day history, geography, maths, English, science, um, et cetera, et cetera. There wasn't a single part of the day where we were looking at the phase one issues around their mental health, around their well-being, around their resilience, around their ability to share, around experiencing failure and what happens when that happens, around um, their behaviour, around reducing anxiety in the classroom. Not one single opportunity and they were wondering why the children were running through the school and there, there was no discipline at all. And they thought it was a behavior issue. It wasn't, it was a, it was a, it was a menu issue. The, mm. the diet was wrong for the children. And, you know, we see that a lot. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that's it. And I guess that's one of the things that's very, very different for many children when they land with you, it must feel very different for them compared to perhaps where they've been, where they've been struggling before. Do you enjoy it? <laughs> do I enjoy it? I, I love everything. I love Mondays. I absolutely love Mondays. Uh, yeah, I love it. I love it. I think we're making a real difference. I think we, 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 I think when we speak about children, my wife's often in the background, she's not in education. And um, she said, every single child you talk about is a good lad, aren't they? Or a good girl. And I think we suffer from good lad syndrome. We, we see the good <laughs> in all of them. Um, that would be the title of the film, wasn't it? Good Lad Syndrome. Um, we love it. We love the children. I love my staff. I think they've inspired me every single day. Um, I think that we're very lucky to do the job. Some of our children have had it terrible. You know, and what an opportunity we've got to serve them and to, to make life a little bit better for them. So, yeah, we love Mondays. Um, we like our holidays and our weekends as well. Um, but no, every minute of it, it's, it's different. It's a challenge. It's, it's good fun. It's tragic at times. Um, I wouldn't swap it for anything. And what does the next year have in store for you? How do you, you know, thinking about that idea around kind of recovery curriculum and all that stuff, what are the big things that are keeping you awake at night at the moment and what are you looking forward to? The, 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 thing, the thing that's worrying me is the age profile of the children that are coming through. They're coming through younger. We're getting, we're getting um, young primary age children. We're getting a heck of a lot of year sevens. Um, Bolton again have been magnificent. There's, we have to understand why year sixes who are coping in primary schools aren't year sevens who are coping in secondary schools. We have to understand that that work's going on, and the, the, the secondary head and the primary executive heads are working on that at the moment. It worries me enormously about the age profile of the children are coming through because if they've not got those EHCPs in year seven, are they going to be with me for two, three, four years? Do we then become a de facto special school? What happened to the carousel type approach of AP? Um, 
I worry. That's my biggest concern. I think is that the the, 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 the young guns coming through now. That that's not. We we were always key stage four. You know when they got to year ten and the schools have probably done all they could with them. Bolton schools are extremely tolerant. They're, they're exceptional. Um, why are there so many year sevens leaking into us at the moment? Is 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 a real concern. We're working with the authorities. We're working with the schools. We've got to enhance our key stage three offer. Um, and we know that. So the, that's the big project in the next 12 months, I think. And what are you excited about? What are you looking forward to? Doing that, I think. I think doing a bit of that. I think we, we, we always love, we work with some brilliant people. Um, as I mentioned, Sarah, Steve, Amy Smith, people like that, Annie Blackmore. They're, they're amazing people. Matt Morris, Andy, the, the Pruse guys. Love working with them, learning from them. Um, the networking opportunities will come back more and more, getting out doing some inquiry visits and, and going looking at some real top practice. I was in Stockton with uh, Emily and the team up there. Brilliant school, you know, to go and learn from people. So to, 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 to resuscitate networking opportunities, I think is exciting to go and learn from those great people. Um, yeah, I think that that as well. Yeah, be really nice to be able to yeah, do those things again, won't it? Although, you know, there's lots of things that we've gained during uh, during lockdown and uh, the pandemic times that will completely change how we do things forever. Um, I think I think I think one of the things that's really come, we were asked the question recently, you know, I think not as an add on, but as part of our offer now. We're going to continue to use the technology to teach children. You know, even if they come here every minute of the day, we're going to use it as a blended offer as well. And I know um, one of the local uh, secondary schools is next door to me, actually, Smithle School. Um, they've they've really done some some good thinking around this, and we're going to learn from them because I think there's opportunities to teach children even better, and to 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 really look at those opportunities. So yeah, I think an exciting twelve months ahead, certainly. Yeah, as we try to yeah. Try and try and think what we want the yeah want life to look like um, in the, in the future. Yeah. It's yeah exciting times. What thought would you like to leave people with? I always think the the you know the last thing that you say during the podcast kind of sits and resonates with people. What thought would you like people to go away with in their mind? I oh gosh, what a question! What a question that is. I think that. I think. I think the, the process or I think the system or the idea or the thinking around good lad sin, syndrome is important. I, I, I met a girl called Courtney um, a few years ago in the car park here. She was starting and um, I went out to see her. I said, hello, nice to meet you. I'm, I'm the executive principal. Um, I talked to her about what had happened in school. I talked to her about her family. I said that we'll really support you. If there's anything you want from us, um, we'll give it you anything at all we'll help you with as I walked away apparently she's turned around to the member of staff and said I wish he were my dad um, that'll do for me that, that'll do for me and, it, and if we can do that and that was a 10 minute conversation with a new pupil you know we have got to show these children that we love them we've got to show these children you know that we care that much about them that we're vested in them because I think I think when they feel it you know we, we change lives and i think good lab syndrome is not a bad idea i don't think so we're going to look for the good in every child yeah i think so love it and hopefully they'll see the good in us because we, we do you know we, we we do hopefully it shines through we're passionate about them doing well and you know if they can feel it then we've got half a chance haven't we